Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Reed Fishler, Larry Bailey, and Michelle Sergio. Coming up on DTNS, the quest to make brain implants longer lived, Netflix's real strategy with gaming. We've cracked it this time. And why is TikTok taking over the world? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, August 17th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And on the show's producer, Roger Chang. My friends, it's so good to be back. Uh, thank you for letting us do Experiment Week. But we're very pleased to be back with Scott Johnson, even though I did get to see Otis, the dog, in person. <laughs> oh, it's my true. God. No it's fair. True. It was kind of worth it. Yeah, no yeah. And he, he minded his, his manners he was mostly. Good, good boy. Yeah. All right. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. And yet another signal that we may be headed for a chip glut rather than a shortage. Reuters notes that tech companies have reported slower annual cloud revenue growth this past quarter. Google Cloud slowed by 8%, Microsoft Azure by 6%, and AWS more than 3%. Slower cloud growth could mean slower buildouts of data centers, and data center buildouts are one of the biggest drivers of chip sales. In addition to that possibility, all three companies indicated they plan to hold on to equipment longer sometimes up to six years in order to save some money. One counter trend is the rise in autonomous cars and hopes for a booming metaverse sector. Speaking of the syllables met and ta, uh, Meta will disable new political, electoral, and social issue ads during the week prior to the November 8th U.S. elections. Ads running prior to that week will continue to run, but Meta will disable most edits during that window and will continue its policy of not allowing posts or ads that misrepresent details of the voting process or spread misinformation on the, quote, outcome of an election. Speaking of elections, TikTok went live with its midterms election center in the U.S. This provides state-by-state -state voter registration information, vote-by-mail instructions, polling place locations, all taking information from the National Association of Secretaries of State. TikTok partnered with Ballotpedia to display candidates on local ballots and election results will be displayed thanks to the Associated Press. Nikkei Asia sources say that Luxshare Precision and Foxconn have started test production of Apple Watch production in northern Vietnam. Apple has reportedly also asked for test production lines of MacBooks to be set up as well. Apple has been moving some production out of China. We've talked about that in the past here on the show. And the company moved some iPhone 13 manufacturing to India earlier this year and plans to assemble iPads there as well. Yeah, it takes time to move that stuff, but it's happening. Uh, the Verge and Windows Central sources say Microsoft is going to release the next major update for Windows 11 called Sun Valley 2 on September 20th. That's my wedding anniversary. The update will add tabs in File Explorer, a new task manager, app folders in the start menu, new live caption and voice access accessibility features, and new gestures for touchscreens. Windows Central also reports Microsoft plans to release its first moment update. Uh, that's an update that adds features, but off the too big yearly cycle before the end of 2022. Logitech announced headphones designed to slide onto a MetaQuest 2 headset called Chorus. These connect to the VR headset's USB-C port for power and are designed to be kept on the device between sessions. Shipping in September for $100. Ah, that's a classic find a need and fill it situation. Well done, Logitech. I mean, I got to tell you, it's, you know, the MetaQuest 2, the... This is actually something I would buy. Uh, you are you are welcoming this idea. I, <laughs> I am, yes. All right, uh, let's get into some TikTok news. Wall Street Journal reports that Amazon is letting its employees test TikTok-like features in its app. Yeah, that's right. Amazon is testing TikTok-like features in its app. Uh, so they're going to show you a photo or maybe a video of products that you can share with other users. Uh, if you are like, wait a minute, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, they all copy TikTok. Yes, Amazon's doing it now. In Amazon's case, uh, the test is called Inspire. That's the name of the plan. Uh, it appears as a diamond widget on the homepage of Amazon's app. Uh, that's according to Israeli-based artificial intelligence firm Watchful Technologies. If you tap on that widget, it'll show you a feed with a stream of mostly images, although there are some videos in there, which shoppers can then like, share, but most importantly, buy. 
Uh, for now, this is separate from Amazon's influencer program. That's the one that lets creators have their own personalized pages and create videos promoting items for, for sale. I expect that if they stick with Inspire and it works, they might merge those programs together in the future. Yeah, it could be. Um, according to an annual report from the UK's Office of Communications, a.k.a. Ofcom, or Ofcom, I don't know which way you say it, young adults in Britain now spend more time watching TikTok than broadcast television. That's a lot. This is based on two separate surveys, one from IPSOS estimated those 15 to 24 uh, ages, 15 to 24, spent 15 minutes per day on TikTok. Uh, a separate survey by Broadcasters Audience Research Board found that 16 to 24 watch 53 minutes of broadcast TV per day. In that group, less than half watch more than 15 minutes a week on public service channels like BBC or ITV. So, so a not, lot of people. I'm not, I'm not sure I heard you right. It's how much for TikTok and how much for broadcast TV? Uh, for for TikTok, it's, uh, uh, oh, oh 15 to 20. I'm sorry, I messed that 50, up. 57 minutes. Min yeah, 57 minutes on TikTok versus 53 minutes on broadcast ah, uh, television. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, big, big difference. Uh, Look we who's got ahead four minutes. here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So why... <laughs> Is this happening? Why? Why? I mean, I, well, I'm not. This surprised. turns into like we are the olds. We don't get it. But Maybe. but but Maybe. Br but breaking that down a little bit. Um, and sorry to cut you off, Tom. Uh, but uh, going back to the you know the Amazon uh, TikTok type thing, it's like I think some people would be shaking their heads like, why though Amazon? But if it's all about showing off stuff that then you can buy because you're already at Amazon, that makes more sense to me than doing it on TikTok. Mm -hmm. No, I, I actually get why the platforms are imitating TikTok. Uh, some of it isn't going to work. Some of it is, you know, you imitating the successful thing isn't always the best idea. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Maybe it'll be good for Amazon. We'll see. I'm going to guess it's not going to work, but why not try it? I just, I my theory on why TikTok has become the predominant uh, thing is not based on it being younger. Y younger folks always enjoy the new good thing in greater numbers than older people because uh, as you get older you get, you get more stuck in your habits so it doesn't surprise me that the new big thing would be most popular with the younger users i think what's nice about it is that you don't have to work at it with tiktok mm. you don't have to choose with twitter with facebook you have to manage your feed you have to unfollow people and follow people and decide uh oh, what's the balance of people i should have here i've always argued that my twitter feed works great for me because i put a lot of work into it to to you know prune out the voices that i didn't enjoy hearing but without creating an echo chamber but that's work tiktok isn't work tiktok still gives you control if you're not liking something you easily swipe away from it but you don't have to choose you don't have to work to maintain that feed you still follow people and all that but that's that's not how most people consume it uh, well and at the is, same time oh go ahead scott no i was just gonna say i think you and i are in the same boat sarah we're both uh you know gen xers but we both enjoy tiktok we both like to sit there and kind of get mm -hmm. lost in it and part of the reason is exactly what tom says they do all the work for you the algorithm adheres to what you like and you just sort of get what you get which is why i always i don't know my ears go up a little bit when i hear stories like more people are getting their news from tiktok or more people are getting their this or that from tiktok and i think well okay, maybe that's true, but it's such a non-traditional way of getting it because it's such a random way of getting it. There's no sort of, let me go in there and follow a chronological list of today's news items or a chronicolo chronological list of whatever from anybody unless you're going to individual accounts. Otherwise, it just feeds it to you. Even on your follow list, it just feeds you the latest and the things they think you're going to want to see the most. And so... But it's also so easy yeah. to be like, eh, I don't like this one. Let's let's bounce out. Right. If you're right. watching some sort of, I don't know, the BBC was one of the examples in the story. It's like, well, there might be a story or two that you're not really all that into or isn't relevant to you. And you just sort of deal with it because it's linear television. Yeah. And this is totally different than that. It actually reminds me, I've probably told the story before, but back in 2006, I was in China for the first time in Beijing and staying, staying with a, a local there. And at, at the time, YouTube was not uh, banned in any way in mainland China, and it was still relatively new. And he was like, oh yeah, I don't watch TV, I just watch YouTube. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean you just watch YouTube? And he's like, 
everything's on YouTube. You just have to know where to look. And at the time I was like, that seems so chaotic. But um, this is, I feel like it's the next generation of exactly the same thing. Well, and that's the funny part of this sto- uh, uh, This 9 to 5 Mac story on the TikTok numbers also notes a Pew Research Center poll that found 95% of U.S. teens watch YouTube. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of become TV for them as well. Uh, it, in fact, I think it was Rob Dunwood on, on SMR podcast a couple of weeks ago was saying uh, his daughter was like, hey, are you on TV? Because because they were putting clips of the tech John up there. And he's like, no, I'm not on TV. It's just YouTube. She's like, that's TV. You know? <laughs> right, right. To her, yeah. Yeah, in it's a lot a of video, cases, they're literally it? watching it on their television, which yeah, yeah. makes it as much TV as it's ever been. So, yeah, totally. sure. yeah. yeah. Well, Netflix launched gaming back in November. Wasn't that long ago, but, you know, we're going on a year. Let's you play mobile games for no additional charge if you're already a Netflix subscriber, of course. There are around two dozen games available on both Android and iOS, but not many folks seem to be playing them. Aptopia recently estimated that fewer than 1% of Netflix's subscribers are playing its games on any given day. Downloads declined from December until May. You know, so there's probably a little uptick of curiosity. Hasn't really seen much surge since. Season four of Stranger Things reversed the trend as people played the two Stranger Things games. You may consider Netflix gaming strategy... Sounds like a flop, right? Well, you also might be a person who considered Netflix's streaming strategy a flop shortly after it was launched back in 2007. Protocols at Janko Rutgers has a deep dive up on Netflix's gaming strategy. So, Scott, tell us more about that. All right. So, Rutgers points out the small number should not be a surprise to people. Netflix hasn't launched any new titles, although they've got some in the wings. They're old games some not as old, some older, uh, that were launched somewhere else first, like Steam, other consoles, and Netflix doesn't advertise it, uh, and the gaming service at all. Really, they just have like a banner ad on the app while you're using it. Almost looks like an ad inside the app, which turns people off. This is not the final form of Netflix gaming. It's basically in learning mode. Um, but there are some hints as to what Netflix might be up to, uh, to doing right now. So here's some of those ideas. Netflix wants to make sure uh, or makes, wants to make and launch their own titles. Netflix has acquired three game studios, including Next Games. And Netflix has multiple job postings around games that describe building a game studio tech lab with people who, quote, learn fast, iterate quickly, unquote. Netflix also seems to want to build a cloud gaming service, which has been rumored for a bit. Uh, how do they know that? Well, according to this, one job posting says, quote, we are looking for a rendering engineer to support our cloud gaming service. <laughs> it's unquote. pretty obvious. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it seems like we got our answer. The job description t- uh, talks about rendering games on cloud appliances and developing SDKs for game developers. Yeah, this, this is how Netflix does things. Uh, in 2007, when commenting on the new Watch Now feature that came at no additional cost with your Netflix DVD by mail subscription, uh, Netflix CEO Reed Hastings said, mainstream consumer adoption of online movie watching will take a number of years due to content and technology hurdles. The time is right for Netflix to take the first step. Over the coming years, we'll expand our selection of films and we'll work to get to every internet connected screen from cell phones to PCs to plasma screens. Now compare that prescient 2007 statement to last June when Netflix's director of game acquisition, Leanne Loom, said, we're still learning and experimenting and trying to figure out what things are going to actually resonate with our members. And cloud streaming, I would argue, is in about the same place that video streaming was in 2007. You can do it. There's services, but they're not widespread. They don't have widespread adoption, and nobody knows which one is actually going to catch on yet. Netflix has said publicly that it plans to build franchises that span across movies, TV shows, and games. And that's what it's doing. It's building the platform for that. So I would argue, Scott, that the fact that they've got all these titles that are not original doesn't matter. In fact, the fact that these are mobile games doesn't matter. This is them just floating some bread on the water to see what the current is like. You are not wrong, I think, in that entire summation. And uh, funny enough, in the last week or so, actually almost exactly to the week, I set out to play every single Netflix game currently available. So I can talk about it more on my show core tomorrow. And I and have happy surprise, everybody. We're talking about it today on DTNS. So this is a perfect place for it. I played everything that they have thus far. And people are going to be a little shocked by my takeaway, which is, and this isn't a tease that I won't tell you until later. I'll tell you now. I think they have a better shot at this than maybe even Apple uh, Arcade has. Mm-hmm. And hear me out for this real quick. The games I played, some of them, uh, a few in particular, are better 
than anything on offer on Apple Arcade. They may not be as new. They might be also retreads that have existed on other platforms, but they're excellent games and they're huge gets to have on this service. The ones I would point out would be Into the Breach, Point P, which you do not sleep on Point P. It's an amazing game. Moonlighter is incredible. <laughs> and Arcanum Rise of Akan, all four of those games are top shelf amazing games. In particular, Into the Breach is an incredible game. And anybody who got to have that on their service as an available title is winning in my book. Now, uh, they got other huge stuff on the way. Uh, Spirit Fair, Reigns of Three Kingdoms, Terra Nil, which is a game that's not even out anywhere yet, so it's going to be a simultaneous release, plus some of their own stuff. They've got a, you know, a chess game based on, the, on the, their popular chess show they had. I forgot the name of it. Um, all sorts of stuff like that on the, on the way. And I'm not saying that this is going to solve it for them or be the big success everybody is waiting for or worth the millions they're pumping into it. We don't really know, but they are making quality games or they're putting quality games out there uh the long term of it is of course unknown to everybody but i could not agree more with with your point about their strategy this is how they did it with streaming movies this is how they'll do it with these games as available through app stores and it's how they'll do it when they start doing cloud-based gaming and they've got the money in the pockets to sort of throw money at it and experiment this isn't a do or die situation for them. So everybody that wants to look at it and call it a flop already, I think are cutting them short. I mean, yes, is it perfect? No, they've got lots of issues. Right now, if I want to get a game on the service, I have to know what I'm looking for and find it in the app store or find the weird little banner that's squished between all the categories in Netflix and click it. Uh, it's a pain to do. That's on the iOS side. On the Android side, I, I, as far as I know, it's the same. you got to jump through similar hoops. Um it's not easy. It's not intuitive. It's not as simple as, say, something like Apple Arcade. But I will say, so far, the stable of games, it's been quality over quantity, number one. And if they can maintain that and continue to put out quality products, both already known products and some of their own, I think they have a real shot at this, at least in the mobile space. And nobody else is really making a try at it the way, say, Apple and Google are with their various initiatives. So, I don't know. I'm not ready to count them out yet. And I had a really good time this week playing like half a dozen games. So there's that. Take it for what you will, everybody. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that they're doing cloud streaming. I think that is a perfect play. Learn as much about gameplay from mobile. Maybe continue to do some mobile Apple Arcade life like stuff because, like you say, it does seem to be working. Uh, and then take these first party titles of the studios that you have bought and the developers that you have hired uh, and put them on a streaming service. You're good at streaming. Uh, and at mm -hmm. first it's going to look like Netflix watch now did in 2007. We're going to be like, well, there's some good things on here, but it's not a lot. And before you know it, it's the streaming service that everybody wants and they spin it out and start charging you separately for it. But for years, it's going to be part of your Netflix subscription. Yeah. And the only other thing I would say to put a pin on this would be, if you have a Netflix subscription and you have a cell phone, there is zero reason for you not to be playing Into the Breach. It is one of the best games of the last few years. So don't sleep on that game either. Go play Into the Breach. Trust me, you'll yeah. love that game. You're not getting any sleep because you're listening to this guy. <laughs> Well, folks, are you feeling social? Uh, let us know what you think of these or any of the other thoughts uh, on our social networks, DTNS Show on Twitter and DTNS Picks, P-I-X, DTNS Picks on Instagram. You may recall when Nika Monford was on the show a couple weeks ago, uh, August 1st, indeed, uh, we talked about the first U.S. brain computer interface, or BCI, from Synchron. Uh, one of two BCIs approved for implantation in the United States. The other type uh, we mentioned at the time is the tried and true Utah array made by BlackRock Neurotech. Utah connection. Uh, the Utah <laughs> array was developed by Richard Norman in the 1980s at the University of Utah. It's a square electrode grid of around 100 tiny filaments. Each one's about a millimeter long. These are very small. The electrode is installed in the motor cortex and connects to a small coin-sized pedestal on your head that is then wired to a device. They are trying to figure out how to make it wireless, but right now it's wired to a device that amplifies and decodes the signals. Uh, it reads neural activity and send those signals to control devices like a computer. Uh, the first, uh, 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 the way they did this was a person controlling a computer cursor uh, with their mind. Uh, you can play video games. You can control a robotic arm, prostheses, things like that. About 30 people worldwide have Utah arrays. And the good thing about having tech that's been around that long is it lasts. That's important 
when it takes brain surgery to replace your device. Not something you want to be doing a lot of if you can help it. Wired's Emily Mullen highlights some of the challenges to extending that durability in an article called This Man Set the Record for Wearing a Brain Computer Interface. Indeed. So 36-year-old Nathan Copeland has been paralyzed from the chest down since a car accident that happened in 2004. He has four total Utah arrays in his brain. The first one has been there for seven years and three months, the longest continuous run ever uh, in tests like this. Ian Burkhart, leader of the BCI Pioneers Coalition, held the previous long run, but his was swapped out in 2021 last year. Longevity is important if we want to make BCIs available to more people because, you know, you get something, you know, it's it's a big deal. You don't want to have to swap it out all the time. Jane Huggins, director of the University of Michigan Direct Brain Interface Laboratory, told Wired, quote, it feels like it's on the borderline of being practical. So what do we need to make these things more practical and to last longer so you don't need multiple brain surgeries to swap out these devices? Yeah, I, I, I would like to... Have, yeah, it seems like an honest question. As few brain <laughs> surgeries as possible. Uh, Utah arrays have lasted up to 10 years in monkeys, but over time, uh, the perilin, uh, it's the material they coat the filaments with, starts to degrade, uh, as well as the fact that your brain just gets irritated uh, by having those filaments in there over time. Inflammation happens, scarring happens. All of that impedes signal detection, and they just don't work as well as they did when they were uh, fresh. Just like your phone, you know, it, it slows down over time. So does your brain implant. That's why they get swapped out. Uh, to increase longevity, BlackRock Neurotech is testing adding silicon carbide to the perylene filament material. Uh, that would extend how long the material lasts before it degrades. A group at MIT is looking at hydrogels uh, to be a coating material that has similar elasticity to the brain. A company called Paradromics is developing arrays with thinner filaments. Those might be less disruptive to the tissue, cause less of that inflammation and scarring. And scientists at the University of Pennsylvania are even developing filaments grown from stem cells. So they would be the material of the brain working with the brain. Another possibility is something called neurograins. They are like nanotechnology, small enough to just be <laughs> sprinkled onto your cortex. Uh, but that one right now is only being tested in rats with their skulls removed. So that one's a bit uh, ways away from being used <laughs> in people. Uh, it does look like we have a little bit of work to do before BCIs become commonplace, right? I mean, yeah, like if uh, I was thinking the other day, um, what if we were some reason in a dinner situation that came up, something came up about implants and why don't we have them yet? And what would they give us? Well, we want our HUDs and we want all our fancy abilities and everything. And we forget that on the side of, hey, people with severe disabilities or injuries are experiencing some of this technology now. Uh, it automatically makes your brain go, oh, well, one day maybe these will be optional. Maybe I can just get one. I don't need to be hurt in a horrible accident or have mm -hmm. multiple brain surgeries. It's just a thing they can do. Mm -hmm. And while that may be true, the obvious immediate uh, focus of this is and should be uh, people who need it the most. So it's that weird thing of I hope less people need it. But since some do, I hope they keep making the tech cool. Yeah. If that makes sense? It's like a weird twisted thing in my head about not wanting more people to get hurt so that we can so that we can perfect this technology but at the same time these are huge jumps it's really cool and the whole the whole scar tissue part of this i mean somebody who i i had surgery last year not in my brain but i did and scar tissue in the body is very real uh it's a normal thing it can it can get a, a little bit out of control at which point maybe it's cosmetic maybe it's something else uh to deal with but that's pretty standard. That's what the body does with foreign objects. One, it's your brain. You have to be really careful about that stuff uh, because you introduce a host of other problems. And I, I, I just, I love the idea of where this is going. And at the same time, I, I hate the idea that somebody would have to go through multiple brain surgeries in order to, you know, keep everything in check. Yeah, it, it does make me wonder if the, the, 
the uh, the winning application of this, uh, the thing that makes it widespread, figures out how to not need surgery or minimally invasive surgery. Mm -hmm. Maybe it just goes into the skull and works wirelessly uh, somehow to detect signals rather than needing to be implanted into the cortex. If somebody figures that out, then you avoid all of this. Not that this isn't important research because it absolutely is, uh, but... But a lot of times that's how innovation works is you do this and you see the problems and then you figure out from this, oh, well, what those electrodes are doing is this and I can read that from outside. Maybe I, you know, figure out this cap uh, that can do the same thing. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but it feels like that's what has to happen for this to become white. Well, that's interesting because you're not necessarily saying we need full absolute mobility out of this eventually. I mean, that'd be nice, too, if somebody yeah. could be walking again and, and moving normally. But there are applications potentially down the road where I just put a patch on the side of my head and I can do, I don't know, a remote computer function while I do something else with my hands. Like there, are, I, there's, there's ways to think yeah. about this that go far and, beyond and the you, current use. If you need the mobility, then you get the brain surgery, right? right? That's why you right. need to keep re researching these, but for less critical uses. Yeah. Maybe there's something else we can do. Sure. Well, keeping on the scientific train here on the show, Texas biotech company Colossal Biosciences is teaming up with scientists at the University of Melbourne to bring back the extinct thylacine. You might say, what's that? It's the Tasmanian tiger. Rawr. The thylacine was hunted to extinction back in 1930. Thanks, poachers, because of a government program that paid for kills. Colossal believes it can use the thylacine's closest living relative, the numbat, and CRISPR, which is clustered regularly, interspaced, short, palindromic repeats, to make resurrection of the species possible. Scientists are divided on whether projects like this could help increase diversity by reversing extinction or whether the money is better spent on preventing existing species from going extinct. Colossal is the same company working on splicing woolly mammoth genes into elephants to bring back the woolly mammoth. The scientists at University of Melbourne have formed the Tiger Lab, which stands for Thylacine Integrated Genetic Restoration Research. Because there's two R's, I, I prefer to pronounce it Tiger. Yeah, Tiger Lab. Uh, this is very controversial, uh, but the Conversations article did a great job of finding five scientists who had very nuanced but different views. Uh, some of the please don't do this, some of the people on the don't do this were like, maybe, but I don't know if we're there yet. I think we need to do more to preserve existing species first. There was one guy who's like, no, we need to put all of our energy into preserving existing species before we start bringing them back because we can bring them back anytime. And the longer we wait to bring them back, the better the technology to bring them back is going to be, uh, which actually kind of was persuaded yeah. a little bit by that one. Yeah. Yeah. How many times do you think Jeff Goldblum was quoted in the comments about you didn't you thought you you, you bothered to think you could but didn't think about whether you should <laughs> whether or you should. Yeah. yeah I absolutely. bet that was With the woolly fun. mammoth for sure. Like the woolly mammoth's been gone for a long time. So bringing the woolly mammoth back brings its own risks of like yeah, but this isn't part of the recent biodiversity. Whereas the Tasmanian tiger was within the uh, last yeah. hundred years part of the ecosystem. So, you know, arguably mm -hmm. you're bringing the ecosystem back into balance at that point. Yeah. Plus our dream, our dream of having a woolly mammoth in the house. To come, it's finally there's a chance. You're there's saying. also I would that. I yeah. would like a mammoth and a Tasmanian tiger. Uh, I've got a backyard. You are all welcome here. Mini okay. mammoth, yeah. house mammoth. Yeah. yeah, house mammoth. <laughs> all right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, this one comes from Alan. This was uh, due to our conversation with Shannon Morse yesterday about. TikTok, uh, I'm sorry, Spotify uh, audio reactions. And we were kind of going, okay, what's this good for? Alan says, as you were describing the new Spotify feature with audio reactions, it struck me it was kind of like an audio version of TikTok, mm. especially if they allow eventually reactions to excerpts and reactions to other reactions. Anybody who's familiar with TikTok knows that reaction videos are very popular. Yeah. No, that that seems seems right. That seems to be what they're pointing towards. There is is the audio of TikTok. Man, if Spotify could really crack becoming the audio of TikTok, and while all these other platforms are just trying to straight imitate it, that might be the move, right? I mean, it's I don't know when it's when it's straight audio. I mean, and listen, many people are listening to the show and say we don't even watch the video version of the show. Like I get it, 
But when you're talking about audio reactions to other audio stuff, I just, it seems messy to me, but maybe I just haven't seen it implemented well enough mm. yet. They also don't talk about whether there's a limit or not. If that's like a 20, if I, I don't want to listen to some guy ramble on for 20 minutes about the Beatles. That I was the key to... of TikTok originally is that it was yeah. short. Yeah. And Give me a shorter, a shorter thing. At least on TikTok, I can tell kind of generally how long a reaction video is going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, you know, make it, if, if you tell me it's 10 seconds or less, eh, you might have something. Well, this show is not 10 seconds or less, but it is over. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's almost over, Tom. We have people to thank, though. Uh, first up, TikTok fan himself, Scott Johnson. Scott, uh, we missed you last week. What has been new? Well, I did my own experiment and played all the Netflix games. Uh, didn't really make a show about it, though, but I will this Thursday uh, because I do a show with a couple of friends called Core. It's a gaming show all about video games, the industry, what's happening in it, and, of course, games we're playing. But it's a bigger, wider picture. In fact, I'd say it's a lot like DTNS, but for video games. So check it out. If you have never heard of it before, go find it wherever you get your podcast. Again, it's called Core, and uh, you can find all the details if you need them at frogpants.com slash core. Excellent. We also have a brand new boss to thank. That boss's name is Tyler. Tyler just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah. And welcome. And, and because Tyler decided to back us on Patreon, I will add to the show uh, that Mark Gurman says the Apple announcement is going to happen September 7th. See, if you become a patron, good things happen. Speaking of patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We talk about all the things, tech and otherwise. But if you'd like to catch the show live, we'd love to have you. We are live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>